Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Thomas. I am the CEO and co-founder of Siona. My topic will be about which roles to hire first. It's going to be hopefully useful and insightful. And after the session, feel free to join my mentoring session as well, which will be probably over there. So let's uh, start with a quick introduction about ourselves. Uh, we've started our startup five years ago, and uh, we were lucky enough to scale up from a two-people operation to 300 people now, and we are also labeled as the biggest startup in Hungary, where we have started our mission from. We were lucky also to raise a 94 million Series B round earlier this year before the huge downturn. And uh, I can tell you the main key to success is to build a world-class team. And then in order to achieve that, you have to get your hiring right. When I was 16 years old, I started my first business, which was basically ordering smartphones from China. I have realized that uh, in the market uh, in Hungary, they weren't selling them with Hungarian language. So I have uh, acquired a tool to download and upload their firmware. And also, I have written a software to change the language of the software to Hungarian. And then I was buying these phones, selling them in local marketplaces online. So I always wanted to be kind of an entrepreneur and running my own business. And uh, that's how I ended up, uh, ended up also starting Sion. And uh, when I was at university, I've met uh, Bence, my co-founder. And we were both very interested in cryptocurrencies. Uh, 10 years ago, we have heard about it the first time. And I was always fascinated by different uh, uh, online payment methods, how people are receiving, sending money, and what are the risks of it. So I got also very interested in crypto. And uh, we had an idea together to actually start a crypto exchange. So we have realized that uh, actually, all the crypto exchanges uh, have a very frictionful process to onboard and accept uh, customers and payments. They were forcing customers to do KYC, know your customer, which is actually uploading your ID, getting verified, and then also they were uh, only accepting uh, bank transfers as the main payment method. So we thought that mm, it's so cumbersome, why don't they accept uh, credit card payments and also uh, why do you have to upload your ID and uh, why uh, they can afford such a high churn? And uh, we have also uh, decided about that uh, credit card payment methods should be the, uh, the way how we would run this crypto exchange. Uh, and uh, we have quickly been attacked uh, by fraudsters. So what we have seen during the first week after starting to accept card payments is actually a bunch of reverse payments, so chargebacks, and we were the victim of payment fraud. This means that uh, actually the customers have called their bank and said that it was not them who have paid for the crypto, so we have lost all this money. And then we got very interested in how this has happened. We have started to research uh, the different uh, dark web forums uh, to understand how fraudsters are operating, what kind, of, what kind of tools they are using, how they are paying to each other, obviously, in cryptocurrencies. And, now, uh, and then we ended up actually uh, to look into different solutions uh, in the market to solve this problem for ourselves. We haven't found uh, an efficient tool because all of them were very enterprise-focused. Uh, they were very high dose about their pricing and product features. Also, they didn't offer a free trial. So as an early stage business, we really couldn't uh, afford to work with them. And also, they didn't want to work with us because we were a small revenue source for them. So we decided to build uh, an in-house tool to solve this problem. And then we have realized that actually, your digital footprint can be a great source of data points, which are collectible uh, from the internet. So that means that your email address, your phone number, your IP and device are all captured uh, during an onboarding process. And then you can enrich these data points and then detect fraudsters. So 
we have pivoted to Sion five years ago and uh, started the business with uh, my co-founder, Bansa. And we were just out of university. So um, I became the CEO and the so-called visionary. And then Bansa became the integrator. And these are two very important roles, which uh, a must have for every business. You need someone as the CEO who is uh, setting the company vision, who is hiring the executive team, who is coaching the executive team, and setting the goals, and as well as who makes sure that there is always money in the bank. And then you have the integrator who sets up everything uh, to make it happen. So helping you to execute on these goals, to make sure you hire right, and you have an office to work from, and so on. I will talk a lot about balances um, and tight ropes, uh, because they are uh, a way of balance out uh, your, your stability. So when you hire, uh, there's always a trade-off. No one is perfect, right? And uh, as you grow your organization, you have to think about to hire people who might eventually become managers. So they have to be good at people management, running one-on-ones, providing feedback. And uh, you also have to hire individual contributors. And then I think it's super important to also set up a career path for every of your functions and departments so people know what will happen next, what can be their next level of advancement. And uh, I think some of the good examples of hiring someone who is talented enough uh, to do the job might not mean that they could be a good manager because they might struggle to make decisions, they might be slow. And as well as uh, when you try to build a team, uh, now remote culture is quite embedded in most of the startups. But to be honest, in order to spend as much face time as possible with your early hires, uh, sometimes it makes sense to actually hire locally. And if you hire internationally, then uh, you can have different uh, ways to actually improve uh, your team spirit. Uh, if everything happens on Zoom, it's hard to always keep in touch uh, with your teammates. And obviously, I think everyone is trying to hire people who are a bit like themselves. So if you would like to have a great pool of new and innovative ideas, uh, you have to also focus on diversity. And if you build a diverse team, then you will have an amazing pool of new ideas, which you might have never thought of. So I think that's super important. Um, and as well as some people doesn't have the growth mindset. So uh, make sure that uh, during your interviews and probation, if you are an early stage business, you ensure that someone has the growth mindset, uh, can get their hands dirty, uh, can uh, roll up the sleeves, and then uh, focus on uh, just Get, get things done. On the other end, there are people who are just being too compliant, which is helpful when you are a regulated business, and also, of course, if you would like to do things by the book. But as well as uh, we have learned that some people are trying to make things more difficult by following the book too much. And as well as people uh, who are more like a generalist can be a good part of a startup, as the next balance says. But some people might work much better in a big company when they have an isolated uh, responsibility, and uh, as well as uh, they don't want to get involved in numerous projects. So it's, it's really different. Some people like this, some people like that. So you have to be sure that the people you hire have the mindset to actually be part of a, of a high growth startup. And then this also means that uh, when you are hiring your first roles, they must be generalists. They have to know have to run high-level different projects, but also they have to execute on them. And then as you grow and as you build different functions and departments, you have to focus on getting actually specialists under these uh, newly become managers who were generalists before. And uh, I think what's really important is uh, actually uh, with your early hires uh, to spend as much time as possible and later, it might not get as important, but if you can always have you know, some personal chats, some beers, etc., after work, then it can really lift up your, uh, your, your team spirit. And then for us, um, actually, one of, one of the ways how to build uh, our team was to spend uh, a few uh, minutes and maybe a beer at the rooftop of our first office, which was 
actually this place in Budapest. And then that's how I could very close to my CPO, CTO, and CO. So our first 10 hires, we always try to find uh, an occasion to, to be together. And then I think also what's very important, if you are a visionary and you have an integrator or vice versa, then you have to actually decide what's your area of expertise. And then you have to hire someone for the other thing. So as speaking of myself, I'm a very product tech person. And I'm not a great uh, sales guy, to be honest. So Bensa, my co-founder, was doing all the business development. And I was the one who was uh, close to our customers, learning about their product feedback, and then helping our CPO to define the roadmap based on the feedback, uh, prioritizing things, and so on. And as well as we have realized quickly that uh, Bensa also wasn't uh, maybe the best salesperson on the earth, but he was doing quite OK. So we had to. Uh, come to the conclusion that actually we have to hire uh, a chief commercial officer who helped us to scale from uh, the level of about 1 million ARR to, uh, to, do, to, to the stage where we are now. And uh, I would say that also one of your first priorities, obviously, is to raise money. And the previous presentation was mainly about this, so I won't get too much in the uh, details. But then, obviously, in order to build an MVP and then find your product market fit, uh, probably you have to get your foundations in product development uh, done. And then that means that you have to have people uh, who actually are, uh, in the beginning, full stack developers, engineers, and they can build your uh, early stage product and as well as uh, make sure that uh, your website and all I presents is, is there. In the beginning, we have tried to, to obviously balance everything on a tightrope, as every other startup founder has done. Um, it might feel if you are on a roller coaster ride, if you're an entrepreneur, there are so many ups and downs. Uh, obviously, when you get your funding secured, you need to get uh, your product out in the market. You have to find early adopters and realize some form of a revenue stream, which might be challenging, but then this is like the cycle of, of getting there and uh, building a sustainable business. Uh, you will find bottlenecks as you grow in every department and project. And if you are uh, two steps ahead, then you can ensure that these bottlenecks will be as smooth as possible. You have to think about building a redundant team and as well as uh, stabilize the different bandwidth issues. So for example, uh, if you get like multiple uh, customer support requests, obviously uh, uh, in the beginning uh, I was the one who was taking care of these uh, queries, but then we had to hire someone because uh, my bandwidth wasn't enough. Or uh, I was the one who was issuing invoices to our customers in the beginning, and then we had to uh, get someone um, doing this because my bandwidth, again, wasn't enough. And this applies to every first function um, in every startup, I would say. So as we grew, uh, I think there is a great balance of finding uh, the best talent for each project, and as well as to build out the people management function and deploy the different individual contributors under each of these functions. For us, it started with uh, myself, Bensa, and then I've met in the first couple of months uh, a guy, his name is Balint, and uh, I've met him through a conference, and he was working for another startup, and he told me he's also taking on uh, freelance projects. And uh, I, I told him on a Friday, hey, listen, can you get uh, our website done by Monday? And he said, are you kidding? I said, no. He said, OK, I can do it. So in two nights, he didn't sleep. He developed uh, our website about five years ago. And then I knew that he's the one he should become our CTO. And after spending some months to convince him to join full time, he actually take on the role. And then in university, I had a very talented classmate. His name is Miklos. And he was actually like a designer, but as well as he fulfilled a PM role at a software development company. He told me that uh, he would be glad to join after actually designing our first website and uh, also 
uh, designing like the pitch deck, and he became our CPO. And these are the people I've, 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 I've been trying to spend most of my time, even now. Uh, they, they are still today our CTO and CPO, and um, they have a lot to push things through, and actually they had as big of a learning curve as myself and my co-founder had. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, I was doing uh, a wide range of different uh, tasks myself as a co-founder in the early stage. So uh, I was trying to be close to the customers, make sure that we have the right priorities on the product roadmap. Uh, I was looking for investors. Uh, I was taking care of finance. My co-founder, Ben, as the CEO, he was doing most of the sales, making sure we have uh, an office and there is someone who is cleaning the office or uh, putting no, new kitchen towels in the office and so on. Uh, as well as uh, Mickey was taking care of CPO of design, product management, and even testing the tool. So he knew Jira very well, and he helped us to implement a different uh, framework for every different project we've had. Um, and as well as, of course, Balint, or uh, CTO was taking care of uh, the development uh, as a full stack engineer. Then as we grew, we realized that we have to separate the backend function, frontend function, we have to build a DevOps team, and then we actually haven't had um, a non-tech hire until we were 12 people. So until 12 people, it was just Mickey, myself, Bence, who wasn't coding, and actually everyone else was uh, an engineer. And uh, I think we didn't need it, uh, actually, sales and marketing people until that point. But then we have decided to hire uh, people uh, part-time in the beginning and double down on content creation. We are a B2B business, but we have realized that actually B2B and B2C sales is quite similar. So people are looking up different topics, and they are usually uh, are typing different keywords into Google. So we have created a, uh, a blog, and then in this blog we have actually try to explain or target customers how to solve the different problems they have in a DIY method. So I am not a native English speaker, but I was good in drafting these blog posts every week. We, I have drafted one. We've hired from Upwork a proofreader, uh, a copywriter person, and he has created like a very easily readable native type of content piece every week. And then we also hired someone who made sure that we have the right SEO set up there for every article, so the metadata and so on was uh, uh, polished by him. And uh, as well as uh, we have hired like a PPC agency to, to start to invest some money into paid ads uh, on LinkedIn and Google, so we could start to measure conversions and, 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 and similar metrics. And then eventually, as we grew like over 20 people, these functions were moved in-house. Uh, for, for cost efficiency reasons. And uh, as, 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 as we scale, uh, I felt like uh, every stage was totally different. So when we were 20 people, I could just uh, stand up in the office, announce something, and everyone heard it. But then when we were 50 people, it was like only half of the team. And then we were like 300 people as of now, and it's totally different. So there's no way I can actually talk to everyone at the same time, unless we gather together or uh, jump on uh, or uh, town hall sessions. And, and you have to scale up the way how you communicate with the team as well. And, uh, and it's quite challenging, to be honest. And uh, in the beginning, uh, I was involved up to 50 people in every interview. Uh, which made up about 40% of my time. And uh, even up to like 150 people, it was about 30% at least of my time to hire people. And then now, currently, it's about 25%, uh, even at this stage. So uh, I would strongly advise, uh, if you are a startup founder, to be very close to your interviewing and hiring process to make sure you hire the right uh, person for the right job at the right time. And, uh, what we've also realized is Central Europe or Eastern Europe is, is not the best place to find uh, go-to-market people. So there are not many success stories of uh, 
uh, startups who actually could sell abroad. And, um, and, and for this reason, we have decided to open up an office in London about three years ago. And uh, we still keep today our R&D operations and tech uh, development in Budapest, which is actually very good for our OPEX, uh, but as well as uh, it's just very limited in terms of the talent pool, how many great uh, salespeople or marketers we can find over there. And so we had to make a move, and I have moved to London three years ago. And um, in the beginning, uh, I was very active at events. Uh, I have uh, broadened my network and uh, actually could hire a lot of people to referrals. And uh, we have been utilizing different job boards to receive some inbound, inbound candidates. And as well as I was doing myself a lot of outbound, so I was messaging candidates uh, on LinkedIn to convince them. And it's actually quite powerful if, as a CEO, you message someone on LinkedIn because they also uh, will feel special and, uh, and I, the conversion rate is quite good uh, in, in, in this way. Um, but we have realized also that when you are hiring hats and VPs, it just doesn't cut it. So you have to use uh, hat hunters, you have to work with an exact search firm. So obviously they are very expensive, but uh, to, to grow faster, you have to have these people who have the experience. And, uh, and, and it's just like uh, the way how it works. So in the beginning, we were quite hesitant about paying so much for a headhunter firm, but then we have realized that it's a must have. So three years ago, uh, we have opened up our shop in London. Uh, Jimmy Fong, our chief commercial officer, joined. And uh, we kept our R&D center in Budapest, and then we have also set up two new offices and uh, later one more uh, around the world. And these offices are go-to-market offices, so um, what happens is um, we try to be as close to the customer as possible, therefore we have people who are like them in their own time zone, and, um, and then these functions are supporting us in business development, customer success, and also in some cases DevOps. And it's not only about who to hire, but how to create a scorecard when you hire them, or how to have like isolated responsibilities. So if you don't uh, delegate something, it might not get done. So we haven't delegated watering or cactus in our first office, and unfortunately, it has passed away, which I'm very sorry about. And you have to create, as you grow, OKRs and uh, KPIs for each department, which you have to live up to and make sure to actually reach those goals. And uh, in the beginning, I think what was actually quite useful for us is uh, bootstrapping for a long time, so we could build a lean mindset and actually understand how we can lengthen our runway. And uh, my advice to every startup founder will be to have at least one year of runway if they want to please their existing shareholders. Um, yeah, as we grew, we moved to a new office, obviously. Uh, we had new challenges, and um, one of the challenges was actually um, uh, to, to select the color uh, for the new office carpet, which we had decided to select our own color. And then we felt like in this new office, actually, there are way more things to decide about, not just the carpet. And it felt like we are among all these different tightropes as a growing business. What I would like to emphasize also on this point is how important diversity really is. If you don't have a diverse culture, then you will see a stagnation of innovation and a lack of company culture. I would like to also make a point of how important is trust. Make sure in your probation time you set the bar high enough and uh, you also hire the best person you can find for the job and focus on the, the what when you actually talk with your reports and not the how, to have, your, to have their buy-in. So if you try to explain all the time how things need to be done, they will lose interest and it will work against you. And as well as uh, innovation, which is also created by your diverse team, will lead you to a successful product launch and then I would encourage you to hear everyone out in the team, even if they have no connection to the product, to see how they feel about different features, and maybe you will hear something you haven't thought of. 
So as I've explained, uh, being part of a company at 20, headcount, 50, 250 is totally different. And we have grown in, in less than three years from 20 to 250, uh, which was quite immense. So scaling up from a startup scrappiness to actually be like uh, a corporate entity is really different. You have to take care of building functions, customer success, product managers, tech, marketing finance, and delegate everything you can. You have to get certifications like ISO 27001, SO2, get pen tests done, because big clients will ask for those. Um, and in terms of the scrappiness, actually, in our first office, uh, we had a shower, and uh, we were also lack of space, so we had to put a desk and a chair into the shower, which was used by us as a phone booth. And, um, and, and I, I, I kind of miss this kind of scrappy ideas. And uh, yeah, in the new office, we actually bought some uh, real phone booths, which uh, were, were uh, expensive, but also we could afford it by then, because we got funding secured. And then, I think, as explained, when you begin your journey as a startup, you should definitely hire multitaskers and then later get specialized people. Yeah, Jimmy, our first chief commercial officer, he's actually sitting in the first row here. He took so many hats in the beginning. He was taking care of even marketing until our CMO, Matt, joined. And then Matt helped us to actually build more functions out and then it helped us to grow and uh, reach even uh, higher levels. Um, I think also it's very important to balance egos. Uh, your people might take proud of their work, but you have to be smart about how actually you make sure that these uh, egos are balanced out. And depending on what kind of company you would like to build and what kind of culture you build, I think it's it's, it's crucial to have this right. He's Matt. He's also the, uh, the, the startups or startups uh, official dead joker. So what I learned is also success equals people plus processes plus the technology. You have to make the right highs at the right place at the right time. And if you want to reach this, you have to balance flex flexibility, but also you have to stay focused. For us, uh, actually, balance also means that we try to, at the same time, solve the issues our customers are facing due to fraud, but also provide them a way how they can reach it the easiest form. So we have actually announced uh, a freemium model of our platform, so every online business, small, medium, and large, can leverage this free plan forever. And uh, yeah, that will be it. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope some useful advice uh, were shared. And feel free to come and join my mentoring session. And wish you all the best uh, for Slash. And uh, thank you again for joining.